the Prusa XL is in a pool of one when it comes to tool changer 3D printers. So let's add some competition by building up something cheaper that's still open source. This video deals with mains voltage wiring, which has the potential to kill. This is not for beginners. Please consult a professional before attempting these procedures. Multi-extrusion 3D printing with a tool changer is something I know many are interested in, and I am too, as evidenced by the fact that I purchased my own 5-tool Prusa XL using my own money. It was, and still is, quite expensive. Plus, early adopters didn't exactly have a smooth time. So let's recap and then propose an alternative. I made a couple of videos about my Prusa XL, the first being my initial impressions. This included unboxing, assembly, which took quite a while considering I paid for the fully assembled version, and also all of the initial calibration procedures, through to my first multicolor test prints, which to be honest, really weren't that great. The outcome of the second video was much better, as I updated my XL from the 0.6 nozzles it came with to the 0.4 millimeter nozzles that had since become standard equipment. I also did some checks and maintenance, addressed some areas that I didn't think were designed that well, and installed a webcam and octoprint to give the printer a modern and usable web interface. The combination of this, plus some updates from the slicer and firmware, meant I was starting to get the results that I would have hoped for when I initially received the printer, which was pretty clean, multi-extrusion 3D printing, albeit still a little bit stringy compared to my other machines. At the end of that video, I made the following statement. And now that mine is working, I would tentatively recommend the XL for those wanting efficient, multicolor or multi-material printing. Many of the comments fell into two camps. People who recently got an XL were happy and had no idea what I was complaining about, and people who were baffled that I could recommend it after all of my issues. But these two camps for me really sum up the situation. Anyone who recently got their machine missed out on a long period with many issues. This included missing or partially complete features, as well as hopefully avoiding known issues. That means for anyone looking at purchasing an XL now, I'm confident that it should work, so it really comes down to price. Three and a half thousand US for one that you build yourself, or four thousand US for one that's mostly assembled. Just too expensive for many people, and with no competition, Prusa can charge whatever they want. So what consumers really need is some sort of alternative. I was contacted by Chris, known as DraftShift, author of The Stealth Changer. It's an open source system to convert a Voron 2.4 into a fully automated tool changer like the Prusa XL. And it's important to know that it's originally based on the tap changer. Looking through the project's wiki, it seemed it was mostly made from printed parts as well as a small amount of hardware like magnets, bearings and bushings. It also featured a modular dock design that could accommodate various tool head options for those building a 2.4. And for those wanting to see it in action, Austin from Hedgehog Makes has a four part series on converting his Voron 2.4 to adopt the system. I like tool changes, but there was only one problem. I didn't own a Voron 2.4, and to be honest, I was still in trouble with Wi-Fi after the cost of the XL. And then I remembered this thing, the Sovol SV08, a self-confessed Voron 2.4 clone, modified to suit mass production, yet fulfilling the terms of the open source license by remaining open source itself. If this could be converted to take the Stealth Changer system, the starting price was fantastic, and additional standalone tool heads were already available in the shop. Like the Prusa XL, this is Core XY, and the build volume is nearly identical. It seemed like an excellent candidate for a budget tool changer, and Chris seemed to think that it could be adapted to take the stealth changer with some time and development. Financially, this made a lot of sense. Comparing the prices to the XL, even with a lot of unknowns and work still to come, it was clear that we were going to come out way ahead with the SV08 as a basis. Previously, Soval offered me the chance to review the SV08, which I didn't take. But when I pitched to them the idea for this build, not only did they agree to supply the printer, but also the touchscreen and an additional five tool heads free of charge. This video is absolutely not a review of the SV08, but I'll still follow the spirit of my review policy by communicating strengths and weaknesses as I come across them. Let's have a look at the unboxing and setup. I'm going to be very brief here as this isn't a full review. From unboxing to first print, this took me around about an hour tools I required were included, and the manual did a good job in going through the assembly steps clearly. Upon initial inspection, there were a few components that didn't exactly inspire confidence. And while one side of the printer slotted together perfectly, the other two corners seemed to be too tight. 
And as far as I could tell, this seemed to be because the injection molded panels didn't quite line up with the internal extrusion. After some gentle persuasion, I did manage to get all four corners into position. From there, a series of bolts are inserted to lock everything into position. However, I did note with all of the bolts in except one, there was still quite a lot of flex in the assembly and putting in that final bolt didn't really fix this completely. In my case, it wasn't really until the top frame slotted down into position that things felt a little bit more stable. This is despite the fact that there's only two small bolts holding the frame on in each corner. The flying gantry is then inserted on an angle and placed into position before it too is bolted into place in each of the four corners. The magnetic cover comes off the tool head, it's then placed on the carriage and is retained by three more bolts. The magnetic cover clips back into position and we've finished with some little things like installing the screen on the front, plugging in some cables, mounting the spool holder and installing the guide PTFE tube. I could then fire up the printer. Connected to my Wi-Fi by putting the credentials on a file on the flash drive, I ran through some basics like homing and quad gantry leveling, loaded up some filament and then one of the pre-sliced benchies, which promptly failed, reminding me that I hadn't set the Z offset. And according to the manual, this was an automatic process. What I learned is that the printer has a regular non-contact inductive sensor, which is used for homing, ABL and quad gantry leveling. But it also has this nozzle scrubber and pressure switch at the back, and the combination of all of this is that the printer can set its own Z offset automatically. It was the tiniest bit too far from the bed for my liking, but even so, I was really impressed by this. Back to those pre-sliced benchies, this first one was at normal speed, which was just under half an hour, and then I printed the second fast benchy, which was timed at around 12 minutes. The regular benchy looked pretty clean, although I have to say the layer stacking could be a little bit cleaner. And despite taking less than half as long, the 12 minute benchy looked just about as good. Again, there's some surface artifacts that I'll need to look into, but remember this machine has been unboxed and then I've hit go, I've done zero tinkering, and honestly it shows how far 3D printing has come that a cheap Voron clone can do this out of the box. A reasonable start, but this printer is not going to become a tool changer by itself, so let's take some baby steps towards that. In my request to Sovol, I asked for them to include the upgraded touchscreen, hoping that it would be running clipper screen and that would make it easier to execute macros related to the tool changer. It came pre-installed in this 3D printed box, along with USB and HDMI cables. According to the instructions, it was possible I might need to update the firmware, but when I went to the wiki and looked at the firmware update log, I was pretty sure I already had the latest version because the belt tension test was already present in my printer's menu. By the way, belt test runs a macro that auto-tunes input shaping, automatically storing the results when it's done. Therefore, to install the touchscreen, all I did was power the printer off, plug in the USB and HDMI, and then turn everything back on. And I was very pleased to find that clipper screen did appear, already set up and working perfectly. So all I had to do was slide the new screen into place, and it didn't fit. The lugs were around 10mm too narrow, and honestly, that's pretty sloppy. So I rushed to printables and found this screen mount by Ed, itself a remix of a design by Nadir. So let's print it on the SV08, and on the flash drive was a guide for transferring over some files to add the SV8 to your standard Orca Slicer installation. Once I had done this, I restarted and the printer was there, allowing me to tick the box and add it. So I set up one part of the enclosure using organic support and sent it to the printer. And it didn't fit. I probably should have read the instructions that said this enclosure was for a big tree tech screen. This print was very glossy and had excessive stringing, and I noticed their profile was using 220 degrees for PLA, whereas the pre-sliced Benchy was only using 210. I actually dropped to 205 and got this very respectable result when printing this simple adapter bracket which I designed in CAD. It bolts to the back of the printed housing that came with the touchscreen, allowing it to slot into position. Our next change takes place on the bottom of the machine and is the reason for that warning at the start of the video. Underneath this panel are all the electronics, including the mains powered bed relay and the power supply. We can see CAN bus wiring going up to the tool head, that's good news for later on, but we can also see this little 24 volt power supply. It's perfectly fine for a stock printer, but we're definitely going to need more oomph to power multiple tool heads and all of their heaters and fans. Therefore, we need to remove this little power supply and convert to a higher wattage one, and I've chosen this Meanwell LRS 350-24V. This power supply is respected and proven, and brand new, they're only $29. My aim was to install this, with everything still fitting underneath that safety panel. Remember that Solvol GitHub? 
Well on there, there's a step file of the entire 3D printer, which I imported into Onshape, and that made my job so much easier. I realized pretty quickly that I was going to need to cut these two tabs that held on the acrylic panel. So I lopped them off with this vibrating saw. It doesn't really matter how you cut them, just as long as they're lower than the tabs just near them. And then with help from this grab cab model by Chris, I was able to design this cradle that fit perfectly into the area provided. It mounts to the printer in six places, and then the new power supply mounts inside it. Here it is, printed in PETG, with some M4 by 8mm bolts and T-nuts pre-installed. We first guide the T-nuts into the extrusion on the left, and then slide everything up until the bolt holes align. We then reuse the self-tapping screws that held on that acrylic panel, tighten up the bolts going into the T-nuts and the extrusion, and that should get the mounting cradle rock solid. The new power supply then slides into place, and another four M4 by 8mm bolts go into the mounting holes on the side. And it's really important you don't use anything longer than this, or they could protrude too far into the inside of the power supply. Everything was feeling good, so now for the wiring. The 24 volt wires are already long enough, so we just bolt them straight into the terminals, but these three main wires are obviously now too short to reach. I disconnected the three wires from the bed electronics terminals, and with some patience, fed them back through to the left near the input for the power. I cut off each of the old spade terminals, stripped back some of the insulation that was no longer needed, which gave me a better length wire to line up with the new power supply. I then recrimped some new terminals using the daisy chain method from the original wiring, giving me a terminal right next to the power supply, and the new wire being cut to the right length to just reach the bed electronics terminals. I repeated this for the other two wires and insulated them with some protective sheathing. As we can see, power comes in from the plug to the power supply and then daisy chains out to the bed electronics just like it did before. And unchanged are the 24 volt wires from the power supply to the main board. To finish things off, a replacement terminal cover like the original. It uses another pair of M4 by 8 mm bolts and T-nuts and attaches directly to the extrusion right next to the power supply terminals. Once these are tightened down, we have a little bit more protection, but the most important thing is the fact that the original protective cover fits right over the top of the new power supply, and once this is bolted into place, the fan inlet for the new power supply lines up perfectly with the original cutouts. Switching back on the printer did not release any magic smoke, and it booted up exactly as it did before. This power supply change by itself doesn't change any functionality, but it should give us plenty of headroom for the power requirements of adding additional tool heads. One more thing I wanted to fix was to address one of my pet peeves, noisy fans running for no reason when the printer is idle. This is a stupidly easy fix. Instead of the constant 24 volts, we're gonna plug in the electronics fan to the port to the right of it. This port is MOSFET controlled and already set up in the firmware as fan three. So all we have to do is to change this to a controller fan using the same pin. And with the setup you're seeing here, it'll turn on when the heated bed is in use, as well as with any stepper motor movements. And when either of those are done, it'll turn off by itself after 20 seconds. I have no idea why they didn't do this from factory. Now the printer sits silently until you actually use it, in which case the fan will turn on and keep the electronics cool. Let's update our running costs, and as you can see, we've got plenty of headroom before we reach the cost of the XL. And I also think it's worth quickly comparing the standard SV08 and single tool XL. There's no denying that the SV08 definitely has some rough edges, and it's hard to imagine it matches the quality of a lovingly built Voron 2.4. And compared to a Prusa XL, the customer support and documentation won't be anywhere near as good. I mean, this is the extent of the wiki as this video is made. But in many ways, the SV08 matches the XL and in some cases is even superior. The build volume is near identical. It has built-in auto bed leveling where the first layer is calculated automatically. It's open source and it benefits greatly from a powerful slicer with pre-made profiles ready to go. The print speeds are faster than an XL, and it actually has an accelerometer to easily tune input shaping. And with no additional setup or cost, thanks to Mainsail, it has a modern and powerful web interface with a webcam included, which means print monitoring as well as time lapses right out of the box. But probably the most compelling thing is the cost. It's three times cheaper than an XL, even with the upgraded touchscreen. Even if a freshly delivered XL works better out of the box, would you rather have one XL or three SV08s? I think that's quite an interesting question and I'd love to read your thoughts in the comments. A small but worthwhile start. And in case you're looking for them, I haven't published any files yet because there's no guarantees this is all going to work. 
There's clearly plenty of development still to come, but hopefully this ends up being a viable alternative as a tool changer. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy tool changer, 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.